Suns fans, you know what time it is in the PHX. Empire of the Suns. Suns. Phoenix Suns. The Empire of the Suns podcast is brought to you by Sonic. Mmm, Sonic. Empire of the Suns. Hello there, and welcome to the Empire of the Suns podcast. My name is Kel Nelson, joined as always by Kevin Zimmerman. What's up, dude? Breaking my name, hyphenated now, huh? I keep wanting to do it differently and not the same way, but uh, tradition, you know, I believe tradition in the premise, the important. promise. Yeah. I want you five seconds in to be like, what, what's going on? I got your attention. That's what's going on. What's Always. Up? Yeah. How's it Undefeated. going? Undefeated. Never. I've never gotten confirmation from any listener that this works, by the way. So tweet <laughs> me and let me know if my theory of breaking up the cadence of the start of the podcast makes you more attentive or not, or you just Confuses will never tell me, me ever. Um, how is that's, that's are, the goal too bub are right. you ready for a seven game road trip which means you are in an office more not at games or game game days are long i don't know it it comes and goes because you you start to kind of um because the practice schedule sort of dictates my life you know so mm-hmm. there are days off for me on the schedule but if they practice on that day no no more day off for me and then to be clear that's a cognizant decision made by me that's just me deciding not to give myself a day off yeah i can take the day off if i want to i don't want to um so that can't happen on the when they're on the road which is great but uh, i love covering basketball games in person especially when i get to see (laughs) performances like kevin durant's uh in those last two games the suns have won six games in a row uh this real uh difficult part of the schedule that we talked about for a while now ever since that started they are seven in two i believe i'm counting eh, let me kind of trail back but i'm trying to think when we counted it probably after that portland game i think is when we went so yeah, yeah they're they're seven and two since then uh they have been or seven and three since then excuse me they have been improved and i think the main differentiation with them as a team that we talked about on last episode is that they are starting to get good enough now to where they can stack wins in the regular season and i think my biggest question going forward for the next two weeks um counting tuesday yesterday that was day one of a 14 day stint away from home they've got a game every other day including one back to back it is dallas indiana orlando miami brooklyn atlanta and washington my question to you is are they either going to remain looking like that team, uh, regress a little bit, or can they take another step forward and start to be like, are we talking about them as a contender in the Western Conference? Because I feel like that conversation, when I'm hearing it lately, has been pretty organ- happening pretty organically, where people are like, yeah, this team can win a championship. And it's like, you got to remember where we were a week or two ago. I'm still not there yet. Um, but I could be there if they just start to really piece some things together on this road trip. What do you think? Have you seen enough positive signs to think that could be coming? I still think we're in for hiccups and, and that sort of thing. I think we're in for like what we've seen the past week for sure, which is a better basketball team, better product, less of those just baffling stretches of bad play. Um, but like <laughs> if Kevin Durant didn't double clutch and hit a crazy shot, um, are we... Are we back to square one? Because that game wasn't good. Like most, most, the first half, I'll say, not even the third quarter really, but first half wasn't good against the Bulls. Um, and so until you get rid of those moments, um, yeah, I, I have concerns because you don't get into championship contender status in my brain when you just don't play consistent basketball, I guess. And like, I, I want to be watching this game team and like know what to expect like okay they're gonna gunk up on offense sometimes fine um that kind of thing like i want to be talking about the offense could be a lot better um i want to be talking about the defense is consistent and that's going to be good enough when the offense we can be start being nick picky about that so i don't think we're there yet just because we haven't seen it's not effort but it looks like effort inconsistencies um and I, I just don't want to talk about contending and going. all of the DA buzzwords disconnected, yeah. unengaged. Speaking of those ones. guys having a terrible week, mm. um, not helping himself though. Ice Portland ice apparently is serious, but uh, his response to that after the game, I just saw. Can I say something? Yeah, I'm team DA on that. Yeah, as, like, a, as a naive Phoenician who has never experienced Tucson ice was before kinda like driving that. through, Tucson uh, just shut Steve, down. Steve Jones was one of the people who was like, if you live in a certain neighborhood, you live on a certain street, like you got no shot. Yeah, 
and other people went there. Whatever. We shouldn't. I saw like, go get a snowmobile. Who has a snowmobile in yeah. Portland? I mean, you there imagine. probably are some. Yeah. Anyway, that was so, bad optics, but then his comment to Mark well, Medina was the, bad. The word you used was nitpicky, yeah. and I feel like that is a really great word to use here because I think we need to be nitpicky with these types of stretches because, again, we're talking about a team that yeah. I thought was going to be the best in the West and maybe the best in the league at this point in the year. And you and I were talking about, okay, my whole thing, the entire regular – before the regular season, I talked about it for like three months, and I was like, okay – if they know who their guys are and they're cooking by January, they're going to be on fire, the best team in the league. If it takes until like the trade deadline, March, like I don't know. And that's what it looks like it's going to be more of. Uh, the win over New Orleans was one of their best wins of the year. Uh, Booker, 52 points, was awesome. Yusuf Nurkic was really, really good in that game as well. Defensively, they had Bradley Beal on Zion and did some really good stuff there. That was maybe one of their, not maybe, it was one of their best defensive performances of the year and maybe their best overall. The Indiana game, I think I'll be the, the nitpicky person here. You're shaking yeah. your head already. I Go think look at them without Halliburton. It should have been more comfortable. Tyrese as a, you talk about like who's the most valuable player. Well, it is like the... Who is like the best player on like the most meh to good team essentially, and it might be Tyrese. Like, do it, you remember it, Steve Nash on like first seven seconds or less? They had like a five game stretch without him. Like, they had really good players too, and they just were like, yeah. Just I think they like lost, went one and four or something, making like, people oh. better, that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah, I thought that should have been more convincing, especially with how they're figuring out the Siakam thing. But it was still, uh, we're at the point with this team now where we're satisfied with them just yeah. figuring it out in the fourth quarter, which is true. Uh, there's just gaps to what we're talking about in this specific conversation. It was a fun game. It was fun. And then the Chicago thing, um, that was just like the Sacramento game. Um, the comeback was different, but the first two and a half quarters were the same. Where it's just Io Desumu was the guy in the meeting watching tape in the morning at shoot around at a hotel somewhere in Scottsdale and was like, oh, I'm just going to sprint down the floor every time and I'm probably going to get like 10 free points in this game. And he did. Um, the transition defense was rough. Uh, the overall defense was really rough. Kobe White on one play, defended by Josh Akogi. Nurkic was in a drop. Akogi gets stuck behind the screen. And Kobe just walks into a, a wide open three around the screen, and he's been phenomenal for the last two months. Yeah. And Okogi was confused with something, and that's the main thing is like the confused looks around and the coverage. Katie had a couple of those in the first half as well. Uh, but all of that, we would be remiss if we didn't talk about the last two games from Kevin Durant. He scores 40 plus points in back to back games on 40 plus minutes in back to back games on back to back nights. I made the claim. As someone who watched enough of Steve Nash to make this claim, who did not watch enough Charles Barkley to make this claim, but I believe, and, and who else would you throw in from there? Like Connie Hawkins, maybe back in the day? Or are you going to throw some Alvin Adams at me? Book? Well, I don't know what you're saying. Just the best overall player to ever put on a Suns jersey. Not in terms of like, so Shaq would technically be the guy. Like that's one of the, oh, like, the yeah, yeah. six, seven best players ever. But you didn't see him at the peak of his powers or near. I'm saying like his basketball ability as he's playing for the Suns. KD's the best they've ever had. Um, I said that in the off season or when they got him, excuse me, and I still believe that now, but this was like one of the first initial offerings of that because I never think he's going to miss when he shoots the ball, but in the second half, like as soon as he got around the, uh, as soon as his backup worked and he was stepping into a shot, I was like, that's going in. And, and yeah. even he had to, the double clutch, not even a double clutch, the midair adjustment for Caruso was insane. I posted the screen cap. Like, Caruso is going to hit the ball if he doesn't move uh, his hand. He was insane in that game, and that is, I think, what we're going to be starting to see more of here. So you talk about 52 for Booker on Friday. You talk about this stretch from Durant. We're going to start to see more of those two guys carrying them on any given night. I don't think we've seen enough of that from them. I think, again, to expectations and standards, both those guys should be first-team All-NBA this year. Do either of them make an All-NBA team right now? Katie, 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 Katie probably does. Um, Book, not so much right now. Um, but both of those guys are all first-team All-NBA talents, and this is them starting to get to that level. Book was there. Um, Durant and Booker both had stretches at the start of the season, but that was in the middle of their team just being a mess and having yeah. zero continuity at all. Now that they've got some continuity, they're healthy, we're starting to the, see those two things come together. Yeah, the two 40-point games by Katie, I think, are very different from... I don't has he had a 40 point game yet this season or like, it was back-to-back -back season highs yeah yeah so uh 
it was a lot easier what I'm getting at compared to like when he and book were really cooking earlier in the year. And I think that's a distinction you have to make because you have the big three, like, and, and even Bradley Beals, what was that the Lakers game where he went off and took over, um, last week, a few weeks ago, but these are coming with the big three all intact. And I think that's really important because those guys have to have that aggressive attitude and get over the like, Oh, we're trying to figure it out and not be timid and overpassing and all that stuff. And I think just allowing them to find themselves in rhythms like that is super important and it's going to happen and it's going to depend on matchups, it's going to depend on the day, how they're getting covered, all that stuff. Um, and that's really where you start again, when you start Nick picking, that's where we can start getting into looking at the little stuff like, all right, how, how do you build defense around that? Well, it's a lot easier to build strong defense around it when Kevin Durant is getting easy looks because they can't send doubles at him every time. Like even when it was Book and Durant, there were doubles going at both of those guys when they caught the ball. So I, I just think that they're in a place now roster-wise, health-wise, and all that stuff, and going on a road trip where we're going to start talking about these little things and, and in the context of this is what the team really – like we expected it to be um we're gonna learn a lot more i guess is where i'm going and and that just hasn't been the case and look if you look at how long they've been together this would be like what 10 20 games into the regular season if they're all healthy to start and you move that into what december Mm -hmm. like they're a month behind but but this is where they should have been maybe a month ago and and i'm for whatever reason, they just didn't learn or teach me anything about the rest of the roster. And now we can get there, I think. Did you ever go to the community pool growing up? Yeah. You remember when you would like arrive in, like, in the locker room and stuff, you're not necessarily like in the pool yet? That's what we're going to do with the trade deadline today. Okay. See, see where he was going? See where yeah. he, was, he was moving? Uh, I wanted like, to say we're going to dip our toes. We're not even dipping our toes, but we see the pool. Yeah. We see the pool. You're excited for it. I don't you're know if you're excited for You this got your one. sunscreen on. You got you know where the snackies are after like that was like getting snackies, snackies at, at the pool was legendary as as a child as a youth I must say. The Suns have limited assets, uh, very limited assets. This is something we've talked about so much uh, since the DA trade specifically that it feels like rehashing, but it's been a while, so we'll bring it up. They can't trade Grayson Allen. Right? I'm going to discuss Grayson Allen. In this again, we talked about it last week. Like, if you offered a, the ideal three D wing for him, I'd probably still say no. If I was the guy making the decision, I'm not Suns fan, so take that for what it's worth. He doesn't know either anything. There's there's a ghost GM for the Suns. I didn't know Shadow GM. Shadow is, is GM the, is the term sorry, that I prefer. I'm sorry. It's okay. <laughs> With um, the assets that they have, uh, Nasir Little's contract is the one that stands out. He's on a four year, twenty eight million dollar deal, I believe. He is on a deal that is small enough to where, especially with the numbers continuing to go up and up over the year and this being the start of his deal, that even if he's not having that good of a year, he's still tradable. He's 23. And he is very young and just hasn't been in a great situation yet. And I'm counting this one too because he's competing with four guys for minutes. Some nights he's playing, some nights he's not. Some nights he's hurt, sometimes he's not. Um, He still hasn't quite found that ideal scenario just yet for him they have got how many second round picks is it four i I believe it's three is it three or four so let's just call it three to be safe but we can go with four i've i've seen i'll go look fake trades abound uh going up (laughs) over the last couple of weeks um on my timeline and all those types of things outside of that uh they have like filler contracts that they can throw in i guess um i'm just saying they don't really have anyone on the minimum who one they would be interested in trading and then two other teams would feel would add more to the deal um necessarily maybe someone is looking at the year that you is having for example and they can um get him uh, on the cheap I, I don't really know they have a couple of trade exceptions that they can use as well but this trade deadline the main thing i want to say is this trade deadline is a big one because this is the last time as a second a- second apron team that they can 
mesh salaries together. Now, they don't really have the salaries to do that anyway. <laughs> they don't really have, like, this guy makes seven, this guy makes 16, and then all of a sudden it's 23, and then you go get this stud. Like, it, that doesn't really work for them. But this is the last time they're going to do it, so I think that they are going to be extremely aggressive in looking on the market, and I think that the main thing that they are going to be focusing on is finding someone who is going to be here beyond this season. I don't think oh. that a rental is going to be something that they really look toward because they need to use their assets in the best way possible to lengthen the uh, timeline of the other three guys, essentially. Like, Nurk is around for a bit. Grayson is someone you can extend. Now, Ishmael's pockets are deep. We know he, he said it a million times. If it's what's best for winning, then I'm going to do it. Uh, what's best for winning is re-signing Grayson Allen. So this is a huge like moment of like, okay, let's see. Like uh, Now, maybe Grayson Allen like, falls off in the second half and this becomes a different conversation later. I don't think he's going to. It, like, Is he going to shoot 50% the rest of the year from no, three? But no, but he's still going to be awesome like he has been. So all of that being said, I think that's what they're going to be looking for, especially. The question is, does that guy exist? Does is Royce O'Neal actually attainable, for example, in this kind of situation? Um, and then this is where the Miles Bridges name oh. comes up. And I think you and I will both plainly state it here and just leave it there for now and say we will have the conversation if he's a Phoenix Sun. But it sucks. It's a terrible idea. They shouldn't do it. You shouldn't have people like that in your organization. There's another name to talk about there as well that we've talked about in the past on this podcast. And we'll leave it at that. Yeah. Um Money wise, easy to make happen, but you're bidding against the entire NBA. And look, if the Suns would do that, then a lot of other teams would do that. Um, talent wise, he's worth more than that. So I, I just don't even think it's going to be in the realm of possible for them with only those. Second he's going to have a he's going to have a big market, and you'd have to get. It would be like yeah. Nas Little, KDB, or Nas Little, Metu. Um, are there any Combo other are th- there any other fake trades that you saw out there? Um, our old friend, we can call him a pal. I talked to him for three minutes in the Pacers locker room. We're we're buds now. Me and TJ McConnell, my oh. favorite Wildcat of all time outside of Salim Stoudemire. They're like co favorite Wildcats. I yeah. would say like you can't pick between your children. That's how I feel <laughs> about it. Weird thing to say about a man my yeah. age. That I just spoke two three minutes ago, but I said it out for loud. Three now. minutes. I can't really yes, take okay. it back. Um, Rick Carlisle called him irreplaceable when I asked about him pregame, and I was like, okay, that was a really big thing to say right there for someone who's been like linked to the Suns for a while. I think TJ is is perfect for this team just because... Ball pressure more than the point guarding, but he yes. is both. Defensively, he would be, and energy-wise, he would be outstanding. The point guard stuff, whatever. Like, I don't, like, him, again... Him haunting the backcourt 94 feet to slow up your transition would just make that not an issue anymore if you can get him great but i don't think you're getting him for what you have you would probably need to throw in something to entice them now i will say again like we talked about with him in the Three off-season way trades exist also you those things that. do exist and they have tyrese halborn already who plays a ton of minutes and he doesn't really play much too guess what when tyrese halborn's out there he should have the ball in his hands tj he should have the ball in his hands and they have andrew nemhard who they like a lot they like him a lot. so that is something to keep in mind. Siakam's there. That's another now secondary guy who, like, when TJ's out there with Siakam and Halliburton's off the court, you want the ball in Siakam's hands. So maybe it makes more sense now for them than it did before. I'm not exactly sure. Maybe without Bruce Brown, they want to add another athletic wing. They got one in Pascal freaking Siakam already, of course, but maybe they want another wing now instead of another guard. I don't really know. Um, he's a name to me. Royce O'Neal makes sense, but yeah. it's like... How close are you to the... And this is no disrespect to either guy. The Terrence Ross gap of... Like the end of your career, this is the last stop. Do you have rotation playoff minutes left in you? I think Rose O'Neill does, but it's in like that kind of range where you're not exactly sure. Where you're going to have to burn half of your cachet of amazing second round picks. But Royce O'Neill, a guy who will not screw up any of the rotations yeah. off the ball, who will do his best on the ball. And I think that wanes from pretty good in the past to whatever it is now average below average up slightly above average haven't watched enough of him to say can hit an open three and is a really underrated passer as well i think he's at like three assists a game this year i saw which is like he's not he's never on the ball how do you get three assists per game that means you're a smart applicable player and he's always been that over his time with utah as well that kind of name and and the way i'll say it is the guy who you know is in the playoff rotation for sure. Like we're we're adding him next to Eric Gordon. Can you get that yes. guy? If they can, it's a home run. Um, they're probably going to hit an RBI single instead, which, you know, we'll see. I think things are churning, but you got to go, huh? 
You have I things, gotta go, man. Things to do. Places the schedule is 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 uh is a bustle in a bit. We had a meeting yeah. at two. We have this at two thirty. I got the segment at three. I probably have another meeting at three thirty that I forgot about or something. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, check your calendars. Okay. Yeah. You're the lead editor, man. I'm not like I'm not I lead reporter it. or whatever. I'm just like staff writer or whatever. Your web lead, web content editor. Your son's beat writer, voice. Are the cats okay? I don't think they're okay. I'm sorry about Boswell, man. It's not going well for you over here. Again, just like one more year in school and it's going to do him wonders. It'll be okay. It'll keep him in school. Okay. You'll get to watch more of him on Arizona. I think he's going to go to the draft and I think he should anyway. No, he should. Like, but not uh, when Jaden Bradley's playing over you. He should for like your draft stock may never be higher kind of thing, hmm. but in my opinion, the basketball development, he should stay another year and it will make him a certified top 10 pick next year. But He's going to be 19 next year. Still a little baby. Still a little baby. Not my, not my, not my child. Not your yet. child. He is not on the... Ch- on the what, 30 U of A Wildcats, who I feel like I care about as much as my future children. 30-year-old TJ McConnell, or however old he is, is your child, though. Yep. Okay. He bantered about Wisconsin. It was great. All right. Bye, everyone.